said, Mike, you're living your life as though you're trying to survive it. This was a number of years ago. And I was like, yeah. So he said, you have to remember something really important. I said, what's that? He said, nobody ever has. <laughs> And I was like, what? He's like, he's like, the mortality rate is 100%. Like, you're not getting out of this thing alive. Stop trying to protect yourself from every possible moment that could be uncomfortable or this or that. You know, and again, look, we have to be mindful about this and discerning, of course. But I think oftentimes, and especially at work, and especially these days when we are more physically separated and disconnected, there's a tendency for us to try to overly protect ourselves and to armor up. And for good reason in some cases, let's be honest. However, most often we do ourselves and our teams a disservice by doing that. And if we can have enough courage to model that vulnerability, not only are we more likely to connect with people and build more trust, learn, change, innovate, all the things we want to do, we also then create that more as a cultural norm. And that's where leadership and management are different, right? Management is a title, a role. I'm, I'm the manager of this team. Leadership is about having the courage to show up a certain way to influence other people. That may or may not mean I have the responsibility of managing people as a part of my job, but it means I'm willing to be a leader on this team and model and operate in the way that I'd like to see other people operate. This is the Workplace Therapist Show. Of course, I'm your host, Brandon Smith. And the entire purpose of this show is one singular thing, and that is to help you either have better conversations at work or form healthier relationships at work. And so today, uh, I'm really thrilled to have our special guest, Mike Robbins, on to guide us through his new book, uh, We're All in This Together. So, uh, Mike, I'm really excited to kind of talk about this and talk about what this means for us as, as teams, both intact teams and even virtual teams on how we can do this better together. Um, so you're a speaker and this is your, is this your fifth book? Yep. Number five. Wow. Wow. I'm really excited to, well, first of all, I'm jealous cause I've only got one book and you've got five. <laughs> so really awesome. Um, and I'm really excited to kind of, uh, learn more about this one and looking through and even reading some of your prior books. I mean, I know they all have some very similar feel around how do we basically build better relationships, whether it's authenticity or yep. kind, of, kind of how we show up as our true self and build those relationships. So yep. um, I, I really want to dive into this book, but before we do, um, just to kind of educate my audience, some of them probably know who you are and have listened to you, but those who have it, tell a little bit about yourself. What, what is it that kind of gets you fired up every day and how did you get doing this? Yeah, well, first, thanks for having me on the show. I'm happy to be here chatting with you and everybody who's listening. Um, you know, so I've been doing this, Brandon, for 20 years now. And the work that I do focuses a lot on leadership and team culture. You know, how do we build those authentic and effective relationships at work and have conversations, which is obviously what your show and a lot of your work is all about. My fascination, my interest in this actually came uh, many, many years ago. I, I was an athlete, baseball player growing up and was pretty good at it. I actually got drafted out of high school by the New York Yankees. Didn't end up signing with the Yankees because I got a chance to play baseball in college at Stanford. Mm. Went to Stanford, played baseball there. Then I got drafted out of Stanford by the Kansas City Royals. And I did actually sign a pro contract at that time. And the way it works in baseball is you and most of the people listening probably know you get drafted by a major league team, whether it's the Yankees or the Royals or the Braves or any of the teams in the major leagues, you got to go in the minor leagues, right? And try to work your way up to get to the major leagues. Unfortunately for me, I was a pitcher, my third season still in the minors. I went out to pitch one night through one pitch toward ligaments in my elbow. One pitch, one pitch. One pi well, you know, I mean, it was, it was a culmination of things, but when the final injury happened on one pitch, like it felt like someone literally shot me with a gun through my elbow. The ball went about 54 feet and I sort of doubled over in pain and, you know, looked at my manager at the dugout and said, you know, I'm done. Um, they took me out of the game, obviously, that night. And I ended up having three surgeries over the next two years. Tried to come back. I had torn ligaments in my elbow. I had some other issues going on in my shoulder as well. But after all the surgeries, I wasn't able to make it back. And now I'm 25 years old. I had started playing baseball at seven. And, you know, I'd gotten an education, but hadn't really thought about what I would do with the rest of my life. Yeah. But as di as disappointed as I was and as sort of scared as I was at that moment, one of the things I became really fascinated by, particularly by the time I got to college and was playing professionally, is I was fascinated by team dynamics. Mm. Because I was on some teams sometimes where we had really good talent, like really good players, but the team wasn't very good. 
Yeah. And it was usually because there was egos or the coach wasn't very good or there was some kind of like just intangible thing that didn't allow us to play well. And then I was on some mm. other teams, Brandon, where the talent was decent, you know, not great, but the team was fantastic. We would like beat other teams that had better players than we did, which I was like, okay, how does that work? That doesn't even make sense. It's cool, but it doesn't make sense. I don't get it. And we talked a little bit about it. We called it chemistry. No one knew exactly what the heck that was, <laughs> but you knew when you had it. And look, yeah. and even if you, even if you never played sports, if you watch sports of any sport, oftentimes you get all excited, your team, oh, we're going to have a great year. We're going to win the championship. We got all the best players and the team doesn't do very well. Or somehow it's like, I don't know what happened. They just caught fire and like overachieved. It's like, that's that team chemistry thing. But now I erroneously thought this was a sports thing. I come home late nineties. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay area where I still live. I got a job working in the dot-com world, tech world. First job I ever had, I realized, oh, <laughs> that whole team chemistry thing, that's not a sports thing. That's a human thing. Mm. In business, we just call it culture. Yeah. And it's basically the same thing. It's all of like, it's all of what you do on this show and what your work is about. It's all of those things. Like, how do we have better relationships? How do we communicate more strongly? How do we create an environment where we bring out the best in each other as opposed to not? And a lot of it is, is intangible. It's nuanced. It's, it's not uh, often, you can't see it right at the surface. You kind of got to dig down a little bit deeper. So after a couple of years working in the tech world, in the late nineties, I started my consulting business 20 years ago, really with a curiosity and a fascination and an interest. What are some of the things that allow that type of team chemistry or team culture to exist? And that's really what all my books are about in my work. And my most recent book, we're all in this together is kind of the culmination of 20 years of researching this and working with so many teams in Silicon Valley, whether it's Google or eBay or, you know, finance and, you know, Wells Fargo or Citibank. I mean, it doesn't really matter the industry or the company or the size. It's really more about how do we create that kind of environment? It could even be a small business or a nonprofit or all kinds of stuff. And you know this just like I do. And in the world we're in today, now the game has changed completely because most of us are at home working from home or coming back to work in some way, but it's very different. And so our relationships and our communication and the culture of the teams are both more challenged, but also more important than ever. Uh, okay. I love this. I mean, you had me a team chemistry. Like, I just love this. And you're right. We talk a lot about culture. And and, and I, I love the idea of culture with a big C, but I want to talk yep. about culture with a little C today. I want to talk about yep. team culture because I think yep. that's so cool. And a lot of people who are listening right now are managers. I mean, yes. they have control of that. They can't always control their big corporate culture, but they can control right. their team and do things. Absolutely. And, and so I want to go way, 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 way back in your story and how you noticed yeah, yeah, we have, can have talent, but sometimes you just had you know bad apples on the team, just bad attitudes, yeah. or we had yep. coaches that weren't like that that great. So right. I I, I want to go into your book, and if there's a way to tie it to that, I would love to because what are some of those things that that um, can help us spot chemistry a little bit better or create better chemistry more intentionally? Well, I think one of the things you have to remember, managers, right? On the one hand we can't control it completely, but we can influence it. And to your point, there's the big culture, like you, capital C of the company. And then there's ultimately the culture that we create or influence within our own teams. I think, you know, with the first pillar in my book, I talk about creating psychological safety and psychological safety is basically group trust, right? It means the group is safe enough for what? Taking risks, speaking up, making mistakes, disagreeing. And so much of that comes from how the manager or the leader of the team operates. Mm. So an example would be managers often say, oh, I have an open door policy or, oh, give me feedback or, oh, tell me if you don't agree or don't, right? Then the question, or, or take risks, fail fast, all these cliches that, right? But then how do you actually react when those things happen? When someone does fail, when someone comes to you and says, hey, you know what? I don't agree with that or I don't like that or I have a different idea. It's often how we respond to that that then sends the message right? As a leader, yeah. as a manager, are you willing to admit, oh, you know what? I messed that up or I need some help or I made a mistake or I apologize. Doing that, yeah, a little embarrassing up front, but ultimately sets the tone for the team. That's how we operate. That's how we roll. And again, just because you operate that way as a manager doesn't mean your team's going to necessarily respond in kind. But if you don't operate that way, they're almost definitely not going to. Okay, got it. So, so is it about um, consistency or uh, so it's like just saying to you like, yeah, I'm going to allow you to fail and that's, that's okay. And I'm going to, and then, and then when you do fail or make a mistake, then I support that. 
Yeah, it's about consistency. It's, it's also about authenticity. So authenticity, the way that I define authenticity is authenticity is honesty without self-righteousness and with vulnerability. So removing the righteousness, like I'm right, you're wrong, because that sets up a defensive dynamic with another individual or with a team. Yeah. And vulnerability is really about embracing risk and and uncertainty and being willing to be somewhat emotionally exposed. So the more a leader's willing to share his or her own fallibility, not that you have to share all the deep, dark secrets of your life and everything that's going on, but share some of your humanity with the team, then they're more likely to not only trust you, but they're going to feel safer to operate that way themselves. So it sounds like that kind of sets up, that leader operating that way sets up this idea of psychological safety. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we know about psychological safety, and I had a chance actually to interview Amy Edmondson from Harvard Business School, who's sort of the world's leading expert in psychological safety. And her work had a big influence on a study that was done a few years ago that many people probably heard of called Project Aristotle at Google. And they spent three years studying what are the conditions necessary to create high performance for teams. And what they found after their three year study was that psychological safety was the number one by far most important element of team success. Yeah. And when I talked to Karen May, who was the head of learning and development at Google at the time, because they've been a partner of ours for years, I asked her, I said, were you surprised by any of the findings in Project Aristotle? And she said, you know, we weren't surprised that psychological safety was important. What we were surprised by was how important it was. Basically, if a team has it, they have a chance to be successful. If they don't, very, very difficult for them to succeed, no matter how talented the individual members of the team are. Yeah, and I love that ties back into your even to your chemistry comment. You can have all these yep. talented players on the team. If you don't have yep. this psychological safety as the foundation, you right. know, then your egos are going to get in the way. You're not going to feel like you can fail. It's going to be more about yourself rather than the team. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so something else I wanted to talk to you about. You mentioned authenticity, and and I know that you know you you distinguish kind of authenticity continuum from an authenticity mm-hmm. equation. What are tell me tell yes. us a little bit about the, what are those two things, and and what do you mean by those? Well, the continuum is basically like we think of authenticity as this sort of binary thing. Like, I mean, they're honest or I'm not, or I'm either it's, it's more on a continuum on one side of the continuum is phony sort of halfway down is honest. And on the far side where we ultimately want to get to is authentic. So it's about noticing where am I in any given moment on that continuum or where is the team and can we move in a more authentic direction? The equation, I sort of alluded to it before, but it's, you know, honesty minus self-righteousness plus vulnerability that's authenticity. And so, Mm. yes, it does take a certain amount of courage to be honest, but it takes a lot of self-awareness to remove that self-righteousness and it takes an even deeper level of courage to be vulnerable. And so those things are important for leaders to understand and for teams to understand that authenticity is not this binary thing. It's also not a destination or like a, you don't get a badge that says, I'm an authentic leader. I'm an authentic person. It's oh, a you practice. Don't? I kind no, of want it'd one be of nice. those. I know I'd love a t-shirt <laughs> that's like, I'm done, but it's an in the moment experience. A, a mentor of mine likes to always say to me, Mike, the truth can't be rehearsed. So it's really nice. about a way of being. And it's sort of, it's, it's an in the moment phenomenon. So as leaders, can we practice being more authentic more often and as a team can we create that as a cultural norm that's how we operate that doesn't mean every single moment of every single day we're being 100 percent authentic it means we're actually aware of sometimes even when we're being inauthentic just like communication right how do you get to be a better listener you notice when you're not listening then you can start listening more right how do we become more mindful oh notice when i'm not being mindful and then that brings me back to the present moment how do i be more authentic Oh, actually notice when I'm not being or when I'm afraid to be and then see if I can challenge myself consciously to be even more authentic. Yeah. So, um, gosh, we could talk about authenticity and vulnerability for the entire <laughs> show. We may come back to it in a minute, but I, I yes. don't want to move completely off from your book yet. So you mentioned yep. one pillar was psychological safety. What's yep. another pillar? Another pillar that's really important related to this and to a lot of your work is embrace what I call sweaty palm conversations. Mm -hmm. This comes from a mentor of mine years ago said to me, Mike, you know, what stands between you and the kind of relationships you really want to have with people. I said, what's that? He said, it's probably a 10 minute sweaty palm conversation you're too afraid to have. He said, if you get really good at those 10 minute sweaty palm conversations, you'll have fantastic relationships. You'll build trust. You'll resolve conflict. You'll get to know people who are different than you. You'll talk about the elephant in the room. He said, but if you do like most of us and you avoid those conversations because they can be uncomfortable or awkward or messy, or sometimes they make things worse before they get better. He said, then you end up being a victim of who you work with and who you live with. He said, but if you lean into the discomfort and have those conversations sooner rather than later, you'll build incredibly strong relationships. Now, look, he was right. 
And that's still not that easy for me personally and just about every other human that I know and have worked with. So it's a practice. But the more we create that as a cultural norm, we embrace sweaty palm conversations as a team. We engage in things sooner rather than later. That actually makes it a little bit easier for us to do that. And it's so fundamentally important, especially in today's world. Yeah, I, my hands are actually getting sweaty hearing you talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means about me, Mike. So yes. here's what I want to do. I'm w watching the clock. We're getting close to time for our break. So right yes. before we roll into break, uh, I'm going to set you up with this question that I want to take on when okay. we come back. So Sounds the sweaty good. palm conversations. So the manager's listening to this and, and she or he's saying, yeah, okay, yeah, I like that. I really want to create a culture of that with my team. Yes. What are some places that they can start? So what are some ways they can turn it almost into a process? So that's going to be my, my question for you when we come back from break. Sounds good. Hopefully it's not too big of a curveball. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe it's a little change up or something. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So um, stay tuned. We'll, we'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for listening to the show. In case you haven't heard, Brandon's got a new book out. He's going to tell you all about it. Thanks, Emily. So the book is The Hot Sauce Principle, How to Live and Lead in a World Where Everything is Urgent All the Time. And if you're like me, and like most of us, everything does feel urgent all the time. It's like hot sauce is being poured on everything, whether it's our work life, our family life, coming from our clients, coming from our boss. And so the book is a practical guide on how do we manage urgency. Not only how do we set proper boundaries, but how do we properly create urgency when we need to? So I wrote the book for you. I can't wait for you to get a copy. Thanks, Brandon. Don't forget to check out The Hot Sauce Principle, available now on Amazon.com. Back to the show. Welcome back from break. Of course, this is the Workplace Therapist Show. Uh, right before break, I was kind of challenging my guest, Mike Robbins, with this question. All right, so the, I love this idea of sweaty palm conversations. And the question before break was, how, how can we put that in play as managers to kind of create those environments with our teams that, a little, that allow us to have those sweaty palm conversations a little more comfortably? Yeah. So talk to us, Mike. What, what are some things we can be doing? Well, the first thing we got to do is identify them. I mean, usually we're pretty aware of what those things are. It's all the conversations we're avoiding. We're afraid to say things, bring things up. But I love the idea that basically bad news doesn't age well. I heard someone recently say bad news or difficult conversations. Think of them more like fish and less like wine. You don't want to let them hang around for a long time because if you let the fish hang around for a while, it really stinks. It becomes a problem. The wine obviously is something good to hang around for a while because it gets better with time. So if you think about it from that standpoint, to identify what are the things that I'm not saying or I'm afraid to say or the team's not addressing or we're not really acknowledging. Um, it's also un important to understand that, yes, these are a little scary. The reason that they're sweaty palm conversations is because they're scary. We don't want to have them. They're usually in the form of conflict or feedback or just some touchy subject. And so I think, again, acknowledging our fear about it is an important thing to do. Um, one of the techniques that I recommend, this is something that I do myself because I don't really like having these conversations, whether it's with team members or clients or my wife or friends or family or whoever, is tell the truth when you first start. So I usually start most sweaty palm conversations, Brandon, like this, some version of, I don't really want to have this conversation or I've been avoiding this conversation or I've been playing this conversation out in my head for a while, afraid to bring this up to you, you know, which is usually true. So being a little bit transparent and vulnerable about our own experience, not to, you know, sort of dump it all over the other person, but just to let them know, I'm scared to say this. And my relationship with you or my relationship with all of us as a team is more important than my own personal comfort. And that's part of being a leader is actually choosing courage over comfort when it really matters. Oh, that's a, that's a good soundbite moment too. Uh, choosing yeah. courage over comfort. Well, what I also heard in this, which I think is so beautiful, is I heard open these sweaty palm conversations with honesty minus self-righteousness plus vulnerability. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So just open it with this authentic kind of opening that's just true and real and honest and not yes. self-righteous, not like, well, it's a really difficult conversation, because, but you need to hear this. It's right. really, you know, I'm feeling well, super uncomfortable, but I really want this for us so we can get better and make, it, make it really about us. Yeah. Make it about us. And also, I think, again, we've all learned this and I'm sure, you know, in your work and your teachings, it's like 
the classic sort of communication technique of using I statements versus you statements. I feel, I think, I notice, not to make it all about us, but it's like those are true statements. If I say I'm feeling nervous or I'm feeling stressed or even I'm feeling angry, you can't really argue with that. If I say you're making me angry or you're doing, you know, but, but now all of a sudden that's both self-righteous, but I've put you on the defensive about what you're doing. Now, maybe I say this thing happened and here's how I felt, or I noticed this last week and I've been upset about it since then. But even that's about taking ownership of our own experience. You know, the natural response to self-righteousness is defensiveness. The natural response to vulnerability is empathy. Yeah. So if we can lead with vulnerability, the other person is more likely to have an empathetic response. Even when I come to you and say, Hey, let's just say, Hey, Brandon, I'm, I'm really upset. I'm really scared to talk to you about this, but it's important in that moment. Now I've gotten your attention. Like, Oh, Mike's a little emotional. He's a little, but, but you know what it feels like to feel scared or feel upset. As long as I don't come in sort of blaming you for my fear and my upset, because I'm not, it's not your fault. It's just, I'm upset about this, or I'm concerned about this, or I'm feeling scared about, or whatever the heck, that's all me owning how I'm feeling. And maybe there's a dynamic between me and you or a topic or an issue that maybe we don't see the same way, but I want to address it. And the best way to address it, although it's counterintuitive because being vulnerable, the fear that we have, and it's, it's not an unfounded fear, is the other person might take advantage of us or they might hurt us. Yeah. And while that is true, for the most part, we're usually not talking about life and death. Even yeah. when it's an important topic or it's something that matters or it's our job on the line or those things, like what happens is our nervous system reacts to fear in that fight or flight way, like it's the same thing. It doesn't really differentiate between the fear of like, I could lose my life versus the fear of I might feel <laughs> a little embarrassed or uncomfortable. That's right. Well, well, and, and, you know, you're two people come to the table and they both have their armor and their weapons on and to right. be vulnerable means you're dropping your armor and weapons. Yeah. And so in that moment, the next the, in your mind, the other person can either do the same thing or they can just take their sword and slice right through me. Right. And, well, and, and that same mentor of mine that said the sweaty palm conversation thing to me said another great thing to me, Brandon. He said, Mike, you're living your life as though you're trying to survive it. This was a number of years ago. And I was like, yeah. So he said, you have to remember something really important. I said, what's that? He said, nobody ever has. <laughs> and I was like, what? He's like, he's like, the mortality rate is 100%. Like you're not getting out of this thing alive. Stop trying to protect yourself from every possible moment that could be uncomfortable or this or that, you know, and again, look, we have to be mindful about this and discerning, of course. But I think oftentimes, and especially at work, and especially these days when we are more physically separated and disconnected, there's a tendency for us to try to overly protect ourselves and to armor up. And for good reason in some cases, let's be honest. However, most often we do ourselves and our teams a disservice by doing that. And if we can have enough courage to model that vulnerability, not only are we more likely to connect with people and build more trust, learn, change, innovate, all the things we want to do, we also then create that more as a cultural norm. And that's where leadership and management are different, right? Management is a title, a role. I'm, I'm the manager of this team. Leadership is about having the courage to show up a certain way to influence other people. That may or may not mean I have the responsibility of managing people as a part of my job, but it means I'm willing to be a leader on this team and model and operate in the way that I'd like to see other people operate. Yeah, I love that. That's great. And one more thing, I, I don't want to be putting words in your mouth, but when you first started talking about having these conversations, I think at one point you kind of talked about then kind of framing it on how this is better for us. Like this conversation yes. is going to make us better and we better. It kind of brings yeah. in that kind of starts with the I but moves to a we. Yeah, and sure. It, it reminded me of um, uh, a client telling me years ago, she talked about how when she gives performance feedback or has difficult conversations, rather than sitting across from the person, she mm. sits next to the person. Yeah, that's Which I think really it's good. such a beautiful image, you know, like we're doing, we're going to look at this piece of paper together yep. versus yep. I'm on one side, you're on the other side, and then we're going to put this thing in the middle and we're going to fight over it. No, we're well, going to get next to each other and kind of look at it together. I totally agree. I think that's great. I mean, physically, you know, being able to do that when we were, you know, together in that's person. A, is, that's a fair point, Mike. <laughs> right. But, but I think, but I think there is, but even if you think about this metaphorically, I mean, look, this is why my book is called We're All in This Together. And look, I wrote this book. I finished writing it at the end of last year. I did not know it was going to come out in the middle of the pandemic when that this phrase, we're all in this together, is something that people are using and have been using a lot in the last number of months. 
the reason why this phrase to me is so important is because every great team that I've ever been a part of back when I was playing baseball, all the years I was working in sales, all the teams that I've worked with and consulted with over 20 years, there's a sense, there's kind of this underlying sense that, yeah, we might have differences of opinion. It's not that everybody's best friends and it's not that we don't ever have conflicts. All those things happen. But there's a sense that there's really no them. It's all us. And while that's a simple concept, that's a hard thing to practice and to keep as a consistent theme in how we operate culturally because we're wired in a way and we live in a world that's so sort of invested in the us against them phenomenon. But I will often sit at the table with a, you know, a team, particularly a senior leadership team and, and ask the question like, who's the them? Explain to me who's them in this scenario right now. Yeah. Isn't it, isn't it all us? And, and at some level you can extrapolate that out to sort of the nth degree to humanity. And a lot of my work and a lot of this book and is, is finding where do we find that common ground with other human beings. And again, sitting on the same side of the table, either physically or metaphorically, when we're giving someone feedback, remembering that even when we have a conflict with another person, even when we wanna give someone some feedback because their performance or their behavior isn't what we want, it's like they're a fellow, not only team member, but a fellow human being. Yeah. And like, how would you operate if, how would you want someone to operate with you if you failed as an example? Right. Sometimes people say, I don't know how to coach this person because they're failing and they're sensitive. And it's like, well, OK, yeah, they're different than you. But how would you want to be related to or when you do fail? What do you want? You know what I mean? Yeah. I think a lot of what makes great leaders and ultimately makes great teams is people getting in touch with their own and other people's humanity. And I love it. I love that it's we can start with our own ecosystem, you know, the people yep. that we're in and give them grace and compassion and empathy and create that environment, and ultimately try and expand it as far as we can with kind of the final, final goal of being able to give people grace and compassion in traffic. That's the, that yeah. is the holy grail, my friend. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> but if we could do that, it's, then we've arrived. It's uh, so we, true. We, we've ascended, but we start with our teams. I, I love that. So I'm looking, yeah. I'm looking at the clock. We still have a little bit of time left. Is there any, yep. any final thought or any final pillar around your book that would be helpful for us to, to talk about today without, of course, giving it all away because I want folks right. to buy a copy of your book. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. I mean, one other pillar that I think is important, given what we're talking about, is care about and challenge each other. So do those things at the same time. I had one of my old baseball coaches, Dean Stotts, who was my coach at Stanford, was on my podcast about a year ago, and he said this great thing about his coaching philosophy. He coached at Stanford for 37 years, had a ton of success. He said, Mike, I always believed as a coach, I have to love you hard so I can push you hard. Mm. And I said, that's beautiful. He, I said, what, he said, I knew that if, if I could establish that I cared about you as a human being first, then I could push you as hard as I needed to push you as a coach to get the most out of you. And, and he said that I thought, wow, that's a, that's a great piece of advice for not just sports coaches, but for leaders in business, for all of us. Can we care about each other so that we can really push each other and challenge each other? Most teams kind of err on one of those sides a little more than the other. Not that either of them inherently are wrong. It's just we got to be able to do both at the same time. Care a lot and challenge a lot. And the care ultimately has to come first because once we establish that people are cared about and valued, then we give each other either explicit or more implicit permission. Hold me accountable, push me, challenge me to be the best that I can. But not if I don't already know that you care about me. Then I'm not that interested in your challenge or your feedback. Okay, so here's, here's my last question for our day yeah. today, but it's an important one. I yes. think we all know what challenging someone looks like. Yes. But the question that I would get often asked and I know people are going to be asking themselves right now is, yep. okay, well, how, I, I care about my team. I mean, I mean, yep. they all know, don't they? But mm -hmm. how do we demonstrate it? I mean, what does it look like to show someone that you care about them? Listen to people, like really listen, ask them how they're doing and actually listen to the response. Um, a second thing that we can do is appreciate people. Distinct mm -hmm. from recognition. Recognition is about performance. Good job, way to go. Formal, informal. Here's a bonus. Here's an award. Here's a reward. Appreciation is about caring about and valuing people, who they are. Mm -hmm. That means even when they fail or even when things don't go exactly the way that we want to, can we let them know what we value and appreciate about them? Yeah. Ways of caring about people. It's really about being curious and interested. It's more of an intention. You don't have to like someone to care about them. You don't have to know someone that well to care about them. You know, it's finding those places of common ground and common humanity and being interested. Yeah. 
that's that's fantastic. I, I love that. Thank you. It kind of yeah. re- reminds me of you know I, I think I think some of the very best parents, slight extension of what you just said, they do a good job of not only telling their kids they love them, but they also tell their kids I really like you too. Yeah, like I like I like this thing about you. You're funny or you're creative yeah. or you know you're goofy or you know you're smart or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but they tell them they love them and they like them. Yep. Uh, so we're, we're nearing the end of our time. I ask all my guests this question. What's one life hack you have for us for how we can have either better conversations or healthier relationships, either at work or, or at home? I think one of the things that we can do, and this is not the easiest thing, but it's really important, is ask for feedback. And my mm-hmm. favorite way to ask for feedback is this. What could I start doing that I'm not doing? What could I stop doing that I'm currently doing? And what can I continue doing that I'm currently doing? Ask our spouse, ask our coworker, ask our manager, ask our children. What could I start? What could I stop? What could I continue? Because that gives them permission to give feedback and Beautiful. it's a safe way for us to receive it. I love it. Stop, start, continue. Love it. Yeah. You're preaching. I love it. Um, well, <laughs> if, we, if people want to learn more about you, the good work you do, or buy one of your mini books, uh, where can they go? Best place is at our website, which is mike-robbins.com. It's just M-I-K-E hyphen R-O-B-B-I-N-S.com. Just as it sounds, Mike Rob- Mike, yep. mike-robbins.com. You got it. Fantastic. Mike, this was awesome. Thanks for coming on the show. I mean, this was a real gift, and thanks for hanging with us. Uh, so I really, really, really appreciate it. Um, and uh, thanks for you all listening and watching the show. Of course, keep up the fight every week and, and listen to a new episode. And if you're not currently listening uh, and you're just watching, well, you should listen. And then if you are listening, rate, review the show. That's how more people find us. Uh, and of course, you can check out the theworkplacetherapist.com for other blogs, articles, books, and resources all for you. And if you haven't bought a copy of my latest book, The Hot Sauce Principle, How to Live and Lead in a World Where Everything is Urgent All the Time, uh, you should buy a copy. It's there for you. I wrote it for you. So until our next show, have a great week and an awesome life. (laughs) 